Welcome to E.G.Friends. I'm Eldon Killian, and this is every board game ranked that I've played in the last 10 years. Uh, so this is the uh, final video in this series where I'm going through every single game that I've played in the last 10 years and ranking them and talking a little bit about them. Uh, so uh, so we're this is a seven. Uh, so these are the, the, the top 10% uh, games that I've ever played. Uh, the top 10% is a thing that I started doing a long time ago. I kind of made this personal list, top 10% games, uh, just because um, I thought like a top 100 was a little eh when I've only played like, I think my first list was like 200 games uh, that I had played. And so it was like top 20 games, top 10%. Uh, I feel like top 10% of the games uh, mean something. And so um, when I made this list, I decided to put it in deciles. And uh, so this is my top 10%. And... Um, yeah, these are the games that I really, really enjoy. Um, th there's a good mixture, I think. Um, there's games I've played a lot. There's the games I've only played once or twice. Uh, but there are games I really, really enjoy. And so, yeah, without further ado, let's go ahead and get going. Uh, so number 66, Sidereal Confluence. I uh, only played this game once. I would definitely play this game right now if I could. Uh, but this is just a really awesome negotiation game where you are, where you can play a really large count. I think I played with eight. And um, yeah, you're just making these crazy deals uh, so that you can run your cards and get new cards and uh, turn resources and other resources so you can score points uh, the way that your race score points. And um, yeah, th this is just, uh, this is negotiation. I'm not a huge negotiation game person, uh, but this is negotiation done right and uh, a really fun experience. Um, learning how uh, the different races uh, work and what you want them to do and trying to find that was a really interesting experience and um, really excellent game. I know there's a new version out and uh, definitely want to try and pick this one up uh, and give it a go again. Number 65, El Grande. I've only played the physical version once. Uh, I've played the uh, on, some online implementations several times. Uh, I feel like the online games um, don't give this game all that it is. And the one time I played it in person, man, it's just an excellent game. Uh, a game I need to get into my collection at some point. Um, and, uh, you know, this is the area control game uh, to end all area control games. Uh, and the way it works and the way you're selecting your cards, um, all the decisions you make feel like they're impactful and uh, just a really well implement, implemented game and uh, a really great one. Anyway, El Grande. Number 64, Grand Austria Hotel. I just spent a bunch of money on the Kickstarter for the base game and the uh, expansion. And uh, I don't regret it yet, <laughs> but I just spent it. But <laughs> anyway, uh, this is another game. I only played it once, but man, I really enjoyed my play of it. Uh, and again, this is from that uh, brain trust of, of designers that have just made a bunch of really good games like Lorenzo El Magnifico, uh, Coimbra, I think is, is Coimbra part of theirs? I can't remember, Zulkin, uh, maybe I'm mixing it up. Anyway, these guys make a bunch of really good games that I enjoy, and this one, this one was top tier, really excellent. Um, I know some people don't, uh, they don't like how sometimes you can kind of had go without a turn for a long time because the way the turn order goes. Um, but you, even that, it's so thinky. That sometimes you need that extra time to think through what you want to do. And um, yeah, I thought the action selection here was really clever uh, and did something uh, really good, the combination of the cards. Um, man, uh, I remember the, the time I played it, I thought I was doing really well and I closed the gap and then the other guy just pulled off this amazing combo and just kind of walked away with the game. But uh, the way those combos flowed together was so interesting and so cool. I want to play it again. And uh, anyway, that's why I spent a bunch of money getting my own copy. So I can play this a bunch. Anyway, number 64, Grand Astria Hotel. Number 63, Clans of Caledonia. This is... Um, uh, sort of a Terra Mystica type game, if, if you're familiar with that one. Uh, but you are, and, um, you know, Gaia Project, uh, which in a lot of ways is similar to this game, uh, but set in space. 
uh, was much further down my list. And um, I don't know what it is about this one. Even though they kind of have a similar feel and flow, uh, this one made more sense in my brain. And I think the way the market works in here really adds something uh, substantial that clicks for me. You know, this is a really good game. Um, but again, I, I've played it twice. And uh, I don't have my own copy. I'd like to get my own uh, to get some more goes in this one. But yeah, really great game. Clans of Cut, Caledonia. Fantastic Factories. Uh, another game I've only played once. Um, and uh, and maybe I'll let you know a little secret if you've watched all these videos. Uh, when I put my tiers together, I kind of threw the games into a tier first and then kind of moved them from there. I shuffle them in and out of tiers on the edges a little bit. Um, but kind of one thing I did was I put all the games into tiers and all the games only played once I put towards the back. Uh, I felt that was only fair if I only played it once. Um, it, it kind of needed to trend towards the back of that tier. Uh, some of them I, I bumped up towards the front um, when I was rejiggering exactly where they went. But uh, so you'll see me saying at the, at the beginning of all these videos, uh, if you go back, you probably know. So I only played this game once uh, towards the beginning because I did. Uh, but anyway, uh, Fantastic Factories. Uh, this is another one I just ponied up some money on Kickstarter uh, to get the base game and the uh, some expansions. And because, man, my single play of this, I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, this is fun. This is rolling dice, putting your dice on uh, the cards to go out and get more cards and just be efficient in the way that you score. Yeah, uh, just really solid and uh, had a lot of fun with this game. I look forward to playing it a lot more. Great game. Fantastic Factories. Uh, Age of Empires 3, The Age of Discovery. Um, have not gotten to play this one a ton, um, but man, just well-deserved game. When I first got on Board Game Geek, this was a top 100 game easily. I don't remember exactly where it was, uh, but well-loved and uh, deservedly. Um, it's a really good game. Uh, as you're sending out workers, uh, and the way it handles those, that like worker placement aspect is really interesting. As you go to settle uh, the lands, and anyway, a uh, really good game. Uh, made me think. Every action I made, uh, there was some, a little bit of unpredictability. There was a little bit of uh, um, just in, it, it was just interesting all the way around. Uh, it, everything I did. I was just interested in the game. I was interested how it was going to play out. Great game. Age of Empires 3, The Age of Discovery. Uh, Keyflower. This is Richard Brees. Um, it's an auction game. Uh, I, I really like how the auction is, works in this one, where you're actually putting out the different colored meatballs facing you around the tile, and you're trying to win this tile. And... Uh, but you're managing this currency of different colored meeples as you as you bid on these different tiles. And um, yeah, I don't know. That, um, one thing I don't like about this game is that uh, my friend Steve is a lot better at it than I am. Uh, it clicks in his brain better than it clicks in my brain. He always demolishes me. And I think it's a better uh, like three, four player game than it is a two player game. Um, and I played it two player a lot, but yeah, it's just really good. Um, and a game, uh, uh, this one I do own and I, I played more than once, but, um, really enjoy it. Number 60, Key Flower. 59, Jamaica. Um, this game I got about a year ago, uh, secondhand from a friend and, um, I wasn't really planning on playing it, but, um, I invited some people over and, uh, somebody I invited had brought a person with them I wasn't 100% expecting, but then all of a sudden we had six players. I was like, well, hey, I just got this game Jamaica. Play six players. I kind of looked over the rules, so we busted it out. And, man, we had a lot of, I had a lot of fun uh, with that play. i played a number of times since. Uh, just an interesting racing game uh, and how these cards work, uh, where one person is kind of dictating uh, how your card, um, how many times you can do the actions, you get two actions on these cards, and they kind of arrange uh, which side is going to do it better than the other side. And then you pick your card to uh, to be advantageous to you. Uh, the way the combat works is interesting, uh, kind of random, but you, you can plan a little bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just a really good race game. 
uh, that works really well. Uh, number 59, Jamaica. 58, Pan Am. This is a game. Um, picked this up. I uh, heard great things about it. Picked it up at uh, Target. Uh, it's one of those Prospero Hall games. And uh, this is a really good worker placement game. Uh, it is not difficult. It is not super complex. Um, and it does the limited bidding thing that, like, um, what was it, Lords of Vegas does? Uh, where it, it combines that with some other like special abilities and special powers and uh, has this uh, thing where every round um, kind of randomly different things will happen. And, um, and the game just plays out differently with that, that little every turn kind of bonus card that comes up uh, that sets the price of the stock and, and uh, kind of sets a rule or gives you a benefit or something. And, uh, yeah, just really interesting. Uh, always a really tight game. I don't know if that's a benefit or or, or a detraction. Uh, for now, it's a benefit. I can see if, if I keep playing this game and it's always a one-point game and always, like, everyone's within one point at the end of the game, maybe that's a flaw because then maybe the game is just really a toss-up and then I just haven't seen it yet. Uh, but for now, it's always exciting because it always comes down to that last turn and uh, trying to gain that, real, that little advantage. Or I just play with really smart people. And uh, and we're always ending up really close to each other. I'll go with that one for now. Number fifty-seven, Concordia. Um, my feelings on this one fluctuate. It's like on a roller coaster. Uh, it never goes real low, but um, sometimes I'm just sort of like, eh, Concordia. But then I play it, and then I think about it. It's like, yeah, it's a really good game. Uh, you're using these cards to to play actions, uh, and then when you then you can choose when you pick up your cards and you get some benefits if you do that at the right and you time that out perfectly and uh but you're going out and you're going out on this board and you're trying to get what you need the resources so you can build things and connect things and you're picking up these scoring cards and your scoring is dictated by these cards that you pick up uh which i always enjoy just a really good solid game uh one i, I need to pick up and add to my collection so i can play it at the whim of my desires but uh number 57 concordia 56 fresco this is a really early game i picked up uh, early in my collection and uh played quite a few times because you know i didn't have a huge collection so i wanted to play something i'd bring this one out and uh, but it's really good um i played it at a friend's house uh and then i picked up my own copy and uh so this one is this you know, the real gimmick of this game is like, it has this like wake up track. It's like, okay, when you wake up and then it gives you some benefits of like, cause you could go early, you get first choice, but also you're paying more. Um, your workers are less happy, which can, it could lose you some workers if you're, if you do if you abuse it too often. And this push pull of like trying to be efficient and get enough actions to do all the things you need to do, but also, you know, managing your money, managing your workers, um, I just really like the way it pulls off uh, state uh, over the years. Um, it hasn't really faded uh, from my memories about how good it is. I don't play it as often as I used to, uh, but I would definitely, I'd play it right now if, uh, if somebody suggested it. Really great game. Number 56, Fresco. 55, Forbidden Island. Uh, this is the Matt Leacock um I really like this one. This is probably the most basic of his uh, cooperative games. Uh, play with little kids, and uh, you're on this island. The island is sinking, and so the board is getting smaller as you're trying to find these artifacts and then escape off of the uh, the launching pad with the um, with the helicopter. And just a really, a really good cooperative game. Really, uh, it's simple, not too hard. Uh, you can go through it. Um, but it, it, you have good decisions that you're making. Um, it's not an easy game, easy to lose, uh, for sure. But yeah, anyway, 55 Forbidden Island, really good game. 54 Code Names, uh, just played this the other day, um, over Thanksgiving, and uh, yeah, just really good. Uh, you can play this with uh, four people, you can play it with a bunch of people. I played a uh, kind of a 
somebody had made up an app so you could play with a huge group and there was probably like 20 people on each side and you're using our phones to plug in what we thought the answers would be and you know the coding was a little buggy <laughs> but it worked it worked with this big group of people uh and it was fun uh trying to figure out what the codes that are and the, the clues that people were giving you uh, i always love that moment when you come up with the perfect clue to get three four uh words connected and it's just so perfect uh <laughs> and you avoid the the bad card i don't know how many times like oh this is a perfect clue oh wait that, that might uh that might trigger the bad card but anyway 54 code names number 53 terra mystica several other games on the list that we've already talked about that i've compared to this one uh but uh yeah this is just a really good solid design uh the races have different abilities. They all play a little bit differently. Uh, and you are trying to go out and terraform the land to be conducive to your settlements. Uh, so you can put your settlements out and score uh, score efficiently. Uh, score the things that are going to score that round. Uh, when you pass, you get to change out what your, like, your little rule breaker is for that round. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um it's kind of a complicated game, but once you get into the flow and once you start understanding it, it it's not as complicated, um, and it kind of makes sense and and it works. Uh, I'm not great at it, just like just like Gaia Project. Um, they're very similar. Uh, there are uh, some differences, uh, and I like Terra Mystica better than Gaia Project for sure. And I'm not great at, it, but for some reason I'm not great at Terra Mystica, but I still have a good time. Whereas I'm not good at Gaia Project. I don't have a good time and it's hard to pinpoint exactly what that is but um but yeah it's a really good solid game design and uh and uh anyway ranked number 15 on, B on bgg very highly regarded well deserved great game number 53 terra mystica 52 architects of the west kingdom uh this is the shem phillips trilogy um that uh this trilogy just the, the third game just came out, The Viscounts of the West Kingdom, which I haven't had a chance to play yet. But um, I really like this one. So um, the, the first trilogy they had that included Raiders of the North Sea, um, I haven't, I, the only one of that series I played is Raiders, and I really enjoyed it. I first played it at BGG Spring, um, came home, got my own copy as soon as I could, uh, played it, really enjoyed that game. Uh, there's a couple things about it um, that maybe weren't for me, but Architects uh, works really well. What you do on your turn is very simple. You're putting a guy out doing the thing, you know, and then you're trying to build up uh, your engine so that you're better at these things, but and then but you don't want to let other people get their engine too good so you can steal their workers away uh, to get some money. And I don't know, just a really good, solid game. Uh, that works well. It can drag on a little long because the end game um, is on the players. Um, so a lot, the, the last time I played this game, I actually, one player, um, we all had kind of assumed that he would end the game. Uh, and so, you know, my, I kind of built up my, me and the other people at the table, we kind of built up our engines and they were kind of stalled out. Because, uh, like, oh, He'll just take that last thing, trigger the end game, it could be done. But he didn't. He kept extending the game, and you know, I was frantically trying to to get that last thing to end the game, and, it, and the game probably went on for another forty five minutes longer than I expected it to. And I don't know if what he did ever changed even the end game's position at all. Uh, but it's kind of weird that he was able to extend it that long. But that's like the only negative thing I can think about in this game. Uh, and even then. It went on longer, but I still had a good time. Just a really good game. 52, Architects of the West Kingdom. 51, Orleans. Uh, I mentioned this one earlier in uh, another video when we talked about um, Altaplano. Uh, but Orleans this is a bag builder. You are getting these little tokens, uh, pulling them out of a bag, and planning and, and putting them out on different parts of the board so that you can get more tokens or do things that will help you score points. And um, yeah, just a really good 
uh, interesting game. Uh, very clever. I don't know. Even Altaplano, which is similar to it. I don't know if there's another game that's like it. Um, Altaplano goes in, in a slightly different direction than Orle Orleans does. Um, I haven't played with any of the expansions other than uh, the, the different board. So, like, when you send your guys away, they can go to a board. I've played with that other board, and that's the only expansion I've played with, and I forget the name of it. But, um, yeah, always a good time when I play it. Um, I remember uh, my, my main game group, which is larger than one table of people, and uh, they kind of decided one year to do it. Instead of doing 10 by 10, they all decided, oh, we'll play a couple of games 10 times um, as a group. And I, and I remember I just got... I got like left out of that cycle and they were playing it and <laughs> a bunch. And I was like, ah, kind of missed out on that. And so finally I had to buy my own copy and, and play with some, with not that game group, but other, other group. And man, yeah, just a really good game. Uh, number 51, Orleans. Number 50, Cartographers. I uh, just got my own copy of this. Uh, the app is fantastic. Um, that's another thing maybe I'll reveal here. Um, so in my gameplays, I do not count games I've only played online or through apps. Um, I have to play a physical copy um, with other people uh, for me to count it as a play. And so there's a lot of apps, um, excellent apps out there that I've only put games I've only played the app version of uh, that aren't on this list. So I had had to have played the physical copy, and I have played this physical copy a few times uh, during that year in the last month or so since I got my own copy. I've actually played it a number of times and I've played the app a ton. Uh, but yeah, so this is a flip and write. Uh, you're trying to draw out this map uh, and there's uh, the way the scoring works is really cool where uh, there's like four things that score. They'll each score twice, but sort of like in a, in a pattern. So the first one will score in the first round and the fourth round. The second one scores in the first round and the second round. The third one scores in the second round, third round, and the fourth one scores in the third and fourth round. Um, so you and you see what they are all at the beginning. So you can kind of keep an eye towards it as they come up. And um, um, but yeah, there's these cards flip over. You can draw it on your on your, on your paper. I played this with uh, some of my siblings, and I thought I thought it was kind of a crapshoot. I was like, you know, they may not like this like this game. The theme is kind of weird. Um, it might be a little too esoteric maybe for them to like, to grasp it and like love it. Cause they're, they like to play games, but they're not big into it like I am. And, uh, so I played it, I kind of left and, and one of my sisters, I had a pretty good idea. did not like it. Um, but then, um, anyway, we we're getting back together, uh, for some, something else. And my sister was like, Hey, my, uh, my daughter really liked that game. Uh, she wants to play it again. Make sure you bring it. And I was like, Oh. So I got requested, uh, which it shouldn't surprise me, but it did. Anyway, really good game. Cartographers, number 50. 49, Heaven and Ale. Um, I played this game a bunch right when I got it. Uh, I played a BGG Spring on a friend's copy uh, one year. Uh, ended up getting my own. Uh, and I played it a bunch right after I got it. And, uh, and I haven't played it much since then. Uh, but I should, because it's such a good game. Uh, I love this, how you're going around the track. Was it four times you're going around the track? And you're, and so like you, you're making this decision on what you're going to give up on. Um, and hoping other things will pop up the next time around so you can score more efficiently. And then, uh, you know, to gain resources and to score points, there's very limited opportunities you have to, and you have, it's kind of a race to go get those scoring opportunities. Um, I remember one time my, my teenage son beat me at it the first time he played it. And all he did, he just took those scoring tokens before I could. And so maybe he wasn't scoring. Like I was trying to build up my things. Like, oh, I'm going to get a bunch of things when I score this. But, you know, I scored half as often as he did. And he just destroyed me, even though he probably wasn't being as efficient, wasn't working really hard at scoring a lot every time he scored, but he scored everything and and he won, which is the point of the game, right? So anyway, number 49, Heaven and Nail. Really good game. I uh, really enjoy it. But 
Uh, number 48, Seven Wonders Duel. Um, Seven Wonders was in a previous video, uh, and I really enjoy it. It's a really good game, but the two-player version uh, is just better. Um, it's a drafting game where the, you draft off of a pyramid uh, or, or a shape of sorts. So, like, as you take up a card, it makes more cards available to your opponent. And so you're kind of positioning yourself to grab these cards. And, um, but the multiple paths to the multiple victory endpoints, uh, is what makes it so good. Um, you know, you can win if you overtake somebody in military and just really pound on, on the military path. And so, uh, it kind of forces you to dabble in everything, even if you're losing. So like, you can be losing in military, but ultimately win the game because you know, scoring in military isn't that great. You really want to win by military if you do it. So as long as you just fend off that person just a little bit, uh, you probably it might be better off for you instead of focusing on military. Um, or you can win by points by dragging it out, or you can win by science. And so, um, so if you allow someone to get all the science cards, uh, they're going to beat you. So you can be focusing on points, but you you got to kind of chip away at the that military and science so the other person doesn't just get all of it. Um, but yeah, just so good. Uh, works really well, two players. Number 48, Seven Wonders Duel. Number 47, Space Base. Uh, this, you know, this one scratches that same itch of Catan because it has that thing where you roll the dice and then everybody potentially is getting resources. Uh and there's not the trading that happens in Catan, but um, yeah, just that rolling and everybody getting something, it kind of scratches that itch. Uh, but the game is more enjoyable. It's not as drawn out. It's not as long. Uh, it's not as um, dependent on, uh, you know, hoping somebody, everybody makes good deals, you know. Uh, so this one, uh, you know, you're buying cards that replace other cards on your Tableau. Uh, and as you replace those cards, they become you know, like your passive income, the income you can get off other people's turns. And so, and there's a couple different paths to victory. Uh, they, there's a card that you can take that if you fill up all of the the energizer things, you win, uh, and that's it. Uh, or otherwise, you're trying to get to the the points. Uh, Forty points, I think, is what it is. It triggers the end game, and then have the most points. And it has a really cool tiebreaker thing where you can't tie. If there's a tie, you just keep playing another round until there's no longer a tie, uh, and then somebody's declared the winner. Um, and, I, and I enjoy that. I kind of like that idea. And it wouldn't work in every game because rounds can be for can be really long, and in this game rounds just aren't that long. Uh, and so adding one more round to the game is not that big of a deal. Um, but it's happened a couple times when I've played it. Uh, but going back to like the different victory points, uh, victory conditions. Uh, I remember one game, uh, my friend Tim, he, uh, he was going for that, uh, win by card and he was so close to winning, but he just couldn't get that last power up on the card. And it looked, I, I resigned. He's like, oh, Tim's going to win. He's going to get that before I get even close. Uh, and I don't believe I won that game, but somebody else did, uh, because it just never, you, you know, you, you think, by chance, he would get that last last scoring token uh, or power up token, but it never, never came. And so uh, he was so close to winning, but you know, ultimately he got last place. He had zero points because I kind of put all of his eggs in that basket, uh, which he should have done, and, and, and it probably would have worked in other days. Uh, but like with that high and low, that tension was just really fun. Uh, anyway, forty seven space base, really good game. 46, Notre Dame, uh, Stefan Feld. Uh, this is one of his older ones. Uh, and I feel different. Like, this is different than a lot of his other designs. But you're uh, drafting these cards. Um, and then you're, like, uh, every round you get to look at three cards. You get to keep three cards. You use two of them to do, to do different things. And the more you do something, the better you get at it. Um, unless you have to move your little supporter tokens in different areas because you don't have enough. Um, and so there, there's this whole like currency management. Um, there's a bunch of points for helping to build the Notre Dame Cathedral. And so you want to send your workers there, but when you send them there, they go away and they don't come back. 
and you lose access to them. And so they're in the, and it costs money and money is really tight. And then you have these rats and you gotta keep, tra- tra- you gotta keep those rats taken down. Anyway, really solid design. And uh, I always have fun with it. Not everyone I've played with has had fun with it. And I can see where some people don't like uh, the style of game, but this is my style of game. Number 46, Notre Dame. 45, Bruxelles, 1893. This might be the game where I've shown my ugly side and was a really poor sport once. But it's so fun. <laughs> uh, I won't tell that story right now, but um, just needless to say, I was really upset with uh, how the first round went and uh, made the game not so much fun for everyone else. Um, but um, anyway, so one cool thing about this game is it has like this grid that changes uh, depending on the choices of play of the the players, and so like what actions are available uh, kind of fluctuates from round to round based on this. And then the the way that you bid on the different action spaces uh, is really interesting, and and you got to be smart and try not to get aced out of really important things. Uh, there's other ways to do some of the actions, and um, anyway, just really, it's a really fun, good game. I think it's a little underrated. It's ranked two ninety, um, but man, I, I feel like this is a really great game. I think more. Yeah, like people, especially people who like these Giro games, uh, would like. And um, anyway, uh, highly recommend if everyone tried at least one time. Uh, 45, Bruce Shells, 1893. 44, Raiders of the North Sea. I uh, just talked about uh, Architects. But yeah, Raiders, a really good game. This is interesting. Like, uh, you're putting out player, uh, putting out a worker and doing something and then picking one up and doing that thing again. So uh, it's like you're playing with the timing of when you're putting things down and picking them up. And um, that that planning is really clever. Uh, thematically in the game, you're trying to, you're trying to gain a, like a, a crew of people that you can go out and raid these settlements and villages and uh, monasteries and to plunder and, to get stuff and victory points and win the game. Uh, but yeah, really solid game. Um, uh, I know one of my friends didn't quite enjoy it because it has, uh, it has just a handful of cards that you can get that, that play differently from the rest of the game. Uh, there's not a ton of interaction except for these handful of cards and you can kind of really hurt somebody's game. And I can see how it's really annoying, uh, if it happens to you, especially early. And, um, but um, but it doesn't happen all the time in the times I've played it. A lot of times those cards don't come up or they come up late in the game where it's less of a big deal. Um, but yeah, anyway, I really enjoy this game, number 44, Raiders of the North Sea. 43, Five Tribes by Bruno Catala. Uh, man, this is another one. I When I bought this game, I played it a bunch. Um, and maybe I haven't played as much in the last few years. Uh, the memories of those of those games years ago were, were really good, really thinky. Uh, uses sort of sort of like a Moncala type idea where you like pick up everything on a tile and drop one off until you get to the to the end and you drop off your last one. Uh, but the path that you take is really important, so there's a lot of thinkiness there. And then the last uh, tile where you where you want to end up um, and hopefully do something really awesome is. You know, and there's different paths to get there. Uh, what so there's all these different colored meeples that you're putting down, and um, and you're trying to make sure you're not leaving something uh, for your opponent. And uh, man, just a really good game. The expansion I think makes makes the game even better. Um, there's two expansions, um, but the one I'm thinking of is the one that makes the board a little bit bigger and adds a different color the other color of tribe and um anyway really good game uh bgg number six it's ranked 62 on bgg 43 for me and uh great game five tribes number 42 modern art uh i really enjoy auction games 
and this is an auction game where everything in the game is dependent on the auctions and uh, the auctioneer what they put down uh, dictates a lot of the game and um, just the so there's all these artists and the value of these artists are 100% dependent on playing them and buying them and keeping them in the game and like the uh, like their value like increases throughout the game uh, but there's only so many cards of that of that artist in the game so like they can have a lot of value but then the chances of them scoring in the end are are less because there's less chance for them to be out there and in be out there enough quantity to actually score um very first time i played this game i think i mentioned that i liked uh auction games and my friend andy is like i showed up to game and he's like eldon play this game with me and i was like okay so we get in there and explain the rules. I'm like, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. And then um, uh, we played one round. I was like, yeah, this is really good. And I just ran the second round. Like, there's one auction type where, like, you're doing a blind bid. You're putting the money in your hand. And you're holding out. And I just remember holding that hand out and just giggling from pure joy. I love this game. <laughs> and uh, anyway... Uh, the version from Simon or Come On or however they say their company name, uh, so beautiful. Uh, some of the older ones, they're nice, uh, but the this the Come On version is just just top notch. The cards are beautiful. Um, I I stole the auctioneer uh, thing from my Article Twenty Seven game. It had a really nice gavel, but I don't like the game that much. So I stole that gavel. I used that for this game. Oh, so good. Number 42, Modern Art. 41, Mombasa, Alexander Pfister. Uh, this I, I this game hurts my brain every time I play it. And uh, I've played it a number of times. and But it's so good. Um, you know, kind of have to uh, ignore the uh, the theme a little bit. Uh, but, you know, it's a, it's a Euro, so theme is just... Just the backdrop and what you're pushing the cubes around on, anyway. But you're, uh, you know, you're going into Africa. You're exploring these different parts and extracting resources and colonizing and and all these things. And but you're trying to push up the value of the different companies as you do those things and gain your value in companies and and move up on these different tracks. Anyway, really good game. Uh, really thinky. Uh, it's so satisfying when you get done at the, at the end of the game and, you know, trying to do that, the book track well is hard and difficult. And, and, but when you do well on it, you just, you feel like a sense of accomplishment because it wasn't easy uh, to do what you did and, and you did it. And uh, anyway, number 41, Mombasa. Number 40, Manhattan Project Energy Empire. Um, I've never played Manhattan Project. Uh, so I can't compare them, but Energy Empire is really good. Um, the one cool thing here is like if you want to go on a space, you have to use more workers uh, plus power uh, than previous people who went there used, and, and you can even overbid that to make it harder for other people to use that same action. And um, but the way like uh, you can trigger the cards, really interesting. Um, the way that you can uh, score points and and manage your pollution. Um, just a really good game. Um, it maybe is a step higher than than like a like an introductory Euro game. But also, once you you've played it, it it kind of flows well and it is not too hard. And anyway, just really good. Uh, Manhattan Project Energy Empire number forty. Number 39, Clank Legacy Acquisitions Incorporated. Regular Clank was ranked quite a bit lower. Um, and in fact, my, I've only played the regular game Clank once. Um, when I played it, I won. I didn't feel that great about winning it. The game was kind of eh, meh. Anyway, fast forward a couple years. Uh, one of my friends has the Legacy game. Asked me if I want to join in on the Legacy game. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like playing with you. Uh, Clank was fine enough. And a Legacy version sounds really interesting. Anyway, the Legacy makes this game so much better. Um, uh just the different things that keep getting added into the game by game. We have, we're not done with it, but, uh, and, uh, COVID has really, uh, slowed down. Uh, we haven't played since COVID 
and got together to play this game, but um, I I want to. I want to get back together. I want to finish this. Um, and I'm not even doing that well, but it's really fun. And it's a fun group I'm playing with. Helps uh, quite a bit. Uh, but yeah, just a really good game. Number 39, Clank Legacy Acquisitions Incorporated. 38, Azul. I have had so much success teaching this game to family and friends. I don't know how many people I've, I've played this game with. I could probably look it up. And it, But it's got to be almost 100% of everybody who at least enjoyed it a little, a little bit. It's not that hard to learn. It's really interesting. There's a really good puzzle there. There's a reason why this is selling a bajillion copies and doing really well and uh, getting all the accolades that it's gotten is because it's a really, really, really good game. Azul. 37 Snowdonia. Um, man, the only thing I will say negative about this game is one time I played a three-player version. I tried to play the, uh, the one scenario where... Um, you go from different sides, and this was really down to play with three players. But one player on one side, and then two players on the other side. And so the two players' side, we're all fighting. This guy was just whoop, doing his thing and scoring all the points. And hey, this is easy. And he crushed us. And um, that, in retrospect, that was really dumb to try and even play that way um, with that scenario. But uh, but man, the uh, action selection por portion of this, uh, the timing of how the rounds work, uh, the weather. Uh, how that impacts uh, what happens in that round as you try to position for, uh, you know, positioning for timing and and so you can do what you need to do. Such a good game. Uh, I need to play this more. Um, but yeah, e even that game where we played this stupid three-player and the one player had total advantage and totally crushed us, I still had fun playing the game. Uh, it, it triggers all the happiness centers in my brain. Uh, anyway, number 37, Snowdonia. Uh, 36, The Crew, The Quest for Planet 9. Great trick-taking game. Uh, I played this with a handful of different groups. I've not gotten all the way through um, the, all the scenarios yet. Um, but yeah, just so fun. Um, kind of grew up on trick-taking games. Uh, playing Rook, playing... Um, some other games like that, uh, like wizard type games and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, just, and this does all those fun things, but like gives you a slightly different twist. The cooperative nature of it, uh, does something that other trading games just can't do, um, beca because of their competitive nature and yeah, just such a great game. Uh, this deserves all the accolades it's been getting. The crew of the Quest for Planet Nine. La Grania. Uh, oh, man. This is a game about farming and selling your stuff from your farm. And, um, you know, every every round you get to play one card out of your hand. And uh, what you do with that um, has these awesome, like, multi-use cards. So you can slide it in there to create more production for you. Uh, you can make your farm a little bit better. You can add more space for pigs or, you know, or more, uh, more, uh, like cards in your hand, help you get more income, uh, set up contracts for yourself. All so you have this one card and it has these four different options and you got to pick one of them. And you have three of those cards or four of those cards and you got to pick one of those cards and then one of those four options. And so it does this interesting thing where you have a lot of options and the trick to the game is figuring out, but you're also limited. It's like, it's gotta be one of these 12 options or whatever you have in your hand. And some of them are very similar and you kind of, okay, so I'm gonna do one of those. But if I do, if I do this one, I wanna keep this card for later to use it later. And there's other way, there's more ways that you maybe you can play another card on your turn uh, where you can uh, kind of get some bonuses to do some other things. <sighs> really good game. I really enjoy it. It's really good. Number 35, La Grania. 34, Pandemic Legacy Season 1. I have not played Season 2 or the new Season 0. Um, Pandemic, I enjoy. It's a fine game. Uh, the legacy aspect of this makes it so much better. It just keeps adding it up. I played this uh, with uh, the same person I'm playing the Clank Legacy uh, with. And, man, it was just so much fun. And um, 
uh, it was really interesting because uh, he had, I think he had already played through season one uh, with his family, um, and then he he had another copy of the game, so he played it. Uh, and we started off with some other players. We ended up finishing it all by ourselves because it just got too hard to schedule everybody. But um, uh, so we just kind of fished out me and him, and uh, man, that was so much fun. Um, this is a BGG rank number two. Totally get it. Uh, makes Pandemic, which is a really good game, a great game. And a fun, a really great experience. But anyway, number 34, Pandemic Legacy Season 1. Number 33, Power Grid. This has like a really cool route building and auctions and efficiency, uh, like uh, resource efficiency. Um, buying and and jockeying for position and just a really good solid game from Friedman Fries. Uh really did a good job with this game and uh, it's one game where I, I've bought a lot of the expansion like the uh, the different power plant uh, the different boards I like how the different boards have their own little flavor to them and and kind of just change the game in subtle ways uh, that make you play a little bit different but don't change the game, uh, but they're great for variety. Anyway, really good game, Power Grid, number 33. Number 32, El Gaucho. This, I think, is criminally underrated. Um, uh, one of my friends uh, picked up a copy of this just recently, and uh, he knew that I liked it, and I, I talked it up, and he's like, I don't know if I like it very much. So maybe I'm just the weird outlier. I, but I really like this game. Uh, it's it's different. Um, so it's like a dice um, uh, drafting game where you're drafting dice and using those dice to try to capture these cows that are out on the on the pampas and uh, and put them into your herd. Uh, but the way the herd builds up is really interesting. Where you you can go up or down. So all the cows have a value between one and twelve. You can either start low and go high, or go high and go low, and then. But as soon as you get a cow that kind of interrupts the sequence, like it's it's like it's in the middle, you sell the rest of the herd, and then you restart with the card that you or the tile that you uh, interrupted with. And um, I don't know. The math in this game is interesting enough that it's hard for me to figure out like that optimal. Okay, this is exactly how you're supposed to play the game. Uh, this is what you're trying to do. And like the unpredictability of when those different cow tiles are going to pop up uh, makes the game really interesting. Um, I don't know. Really good game. Uh, if you like dice drafting, if you like uh, um, trying to get things in order, um, if you're, I don't know. I think it's a really good game. I think it's underrated. Number 32, El Gaucho. 31 Tech Hanu. This is one of my newest games. Uh, I think the first time I played this was in October, um, right as I was finishing up the list. Uh, BGG is really liking this game. I really like this game. Um, it's from that design group is just making all these great games, and I think they knocked this one out of the park too. Um, but yeah, so this is interesting game where you're drafting dice and you take them. Uh, off of this like circular wheel and each round uh, the each position on the wheel is in a different state it's either light dark or uh, or neutral or uh, I can't remember the terms that they use uh, but uh, pure tainted and neutral I guess and um, anyway uh, <laughs> I was just thinking about that's not 100% right either but I'm not remembering it anyway but as you take the dice, you're trying to keep them balanced from being pure and tainted. Uh, because if you're too far tainted, uh, it's going to cost you some points. If you're too far pure, you're going to lose your, yourself turn order. Um, and, um, and so you're trying to balance that as you are trying to choose your best actions as well. Uh, it's just a really clever puzzle. Um, it's real busy. Uh, you know, it's kind of top heavy on the rules. You, you need to know a lot of things before you start into it. Uh, but really good game. 
I uh, really love this one. Tekanu, Obelisk of the Sun. Number 30, no thanks. Uh, I've played this game over 100 times. Um, when I was uh, first going back to school to be a teacher, I was subbing. And um, this is one game I kept in my backpack. Uh, and as I went to different classes, uh, I, sometimes when things broke down, sometimes uh, teachers didn't always leave a lot of work for kids to do or that, you know, kids weren't doing something. Uh, this is one game I would sometimes pull out with them. And uh, I remember I was in a high school class and um, I, was, I was in this class for like three or four days. After the first day, um, it was obvious that uh, the lesson plans were not sufficient to keep these guys busy uh, in all the classes all day long. So I had these different, this rotating group of kids. They'd all come in. There'd be one or two kids that had work still to do on their project. Everybody else was done and really nothing to do. Um, so, and, uh, you know, I, I was like, I asked the kids, like, hey, where's your project? And they showed me their project. I was like, is there anything else you need to do? No, nah, it's done. It's like, all right. And so some of the kids uh, on the first day, they brought out some cards and we're playing this really dumb card game. Don't remember the name of it. It's not something I knew, but it was just, it was basically like LCR, no decision making, just kind of flipping over cards. And But they were really into it. Anyway, so the, the next day I brought No Thanks and I said, hey, you guys want to learn a game? And, uh, man, it became, there were, there was like these six kids and they were, they just could not get enough of it. And I, you know, I kind of showed them how to play. I didn't really play that day, but I was watching them. Uh, one kid, uh, got super into it. Anyway, we were playing and, uh, on that first day and, uh, that was like in first period. And then later, like, uh, during the th like third or fourth period, I saw this kid, um, it was, it was this giant like shop and like kids were kind of, it's kind of hard to keep track of everybody. But I see this kid, I was like, Hey, are you in this you first and third period? And he's like, uh, no, I just wanted to play the game again. <laughs> anyway, had to send him away. Uh, yeah, go back to your class. Get out of here. Anyway, it's so simple. I uh, played this with third, fourth graders. Um, sometimes the math at the end, you got to help them with it. Uh, but yeah, you take the card or you put a chip on. Uh, if you take the card that has chips on it, you get the chips. Chips are negative points. The cards are positive points. You want to have a low score. So simple. So good. Uh, like I said, I've played this well over a hundred times. Just really good. And uh, I, I still enjoy it. Great game. Number 30. No thanks. Number 29, Terraforming Mars. Uh, yeah, super popular game. Uh, Well-deserved. I really enjoy it. Uh, maybe not, you know, not my favorite of favorite games, but really good. I really enjoy it. Um, and, um, you know, I haven't played with all the expansions. I just picked them up. Uh, a friend of mine was selling his copy with a bunch of expansions, and, I, and so I, I took that off his hands up for him. And, uh, but I haven't had a chance to like dig into those expansions yet, but, um, just mostly goes to Corona, um, coronavirus, but, um, anyway, Terraform Mars, really good game. You're drafting cards. I like to play the draft variant. Um, you are trying to terraform Mars and, and do it better than everybody else and get the accolades. Uh, anyway, yeah. Number 29, Terraform Mars. 28, Amerigo, Stefan Feld. Uh, I know some people criticize this game because uh, one of the actions tends to just not be a viable thing to do towards the end of the game. But I think that uh, is actually a selling point for me because it changes your thought process as you get into that end round. And there's some strategic choices to be made before, until, before you get there. Um, but yeah, this again, stuff and felt. Uh, the scoring, if you like to just take the mathematical portion of the scoring, is very similar to a lot of those other games. You, you can score in lots of different ways by doing different things. Uh, so you're trying to do it efficiently. Uh, but the way that you choose your actions uh, is different uh, than in those other games, even though the scoring end of it is really similar. Uh, how you choose those actions is where this game is so fun and what you're doing with those actions 
Uh, so yeah, you're going around, you're discovering these different islands. Um, you're putting out buildings on these islands and, and trying to score points in all the different ways that there are score points. I really enjoy it. Really fun game. Number 28, Amerigo. 27, Glenmore. Uh, I really want to get the new version of this. Uh, um, but yeah, so this is uh, Matthias Kramer. Uh, this is the game uh, where you're a Scottish clansman and you're trying to, I don't know, develop your lands and make whiskey and score points. This has the cool track uh, where if you're the last in the line, uh, you can take you get to take your turn. You can jump as far as you want, but you, you don't get to go again until you're last in the line again. Uh, so you can get situations where you can take multiple tiles. And uh, one thing that, that sets up a situation where you might be able to get multiple tiles is uh, having more tiles than other people gets you negative points at the end of the game. So, uh, But if you can score more points out of those tiles uh, than those points you would lose... Sometimes it's worth it uh, to build up your your uh, your tile building thing that you're doing. Anyway, uh, also the scoring here is really interesting. It's like you score um, depending on how much more you have of the person who has the least of, of all these different categories of things. Uh, anyway, really good game. Uh, it was really funny. The very first time I played this, it was like a full player count. And... Um, it took forever. I remember at one point, like I went like a whole half hour without making a turn, and I thought it was really weird. And it might have soured me just a little bit on it, but I still really had a, had a good time. But then, the, all my subsequent plays of it since then, that's never happened. And I don't know what it was with that group. I don't know what it was. I played it with like full player count again, and the game just flows really, really well. Uh, you can play the game like in an hour um, if you're just kind of cruising along. And uh, I play this game online. It plays really well. Some of the online imp implementations are pretty good. Um, yeah, great game. Like I said, I really want to get the second version. It has like a legacy E type thing to it. Anyway, number 27, Glenmore. 26, Pulsar 2849. This is uh, so it's Vladimir Suchi. Uh, space game. Uh, man, this game is just really fun. So you roll these dice and you're and you're drafting these dice. And as you take them, like depending on how far away from like the median they are, you kind of, like you, there's like this negative aspect to taking really high or really low numbers um, from that median. Uh, but sometimes that's what you need and that's what you want to do. And, um, uh, and so it kind of balances out uh, how you're doing those things. Uh, anyway, uh, the game's called Pulsar 2849. You want to go to the Pulsars, build them up, uh, you create like, they call them like gyrodynes or something like that. And, um, and you're scoring points through those. Uh, there's a lot of variability, like what scores every round kind of changes from game to game. And there's a bunch of different combinations. In game scoring, there's a bunch of different combinations. Uh, so every game's just a slightly different. And uh, trying to figure out that puzzle is really interesting. Anyway. Really good game. Pulsar 2849. Number 25, For Sale. Another little short uh, little game. This is another game I used to take with me when I was subbing. And uh, some kids really <laughs> enjoyed this one. Uh, I don't remember playing it uh, that much. But um, but I played it a lot. I played a lot with a lot of different groups, family, friends. Uh, it has a great like two-part uh, game like the first half of the game you're doing one thing and the second half of the game you're using those cards uh, that you got in the first half to to do uh, you're selling so you're buying uh, you're buying the properties and then selling them uh, and trying to sell them to customers and there's just this interesting like if you are playing clever you can uh, it's all about selling it for more than what you bought it for and you can be clever, and you can pull off some great gains off of really bad properties. Um, and uh, proper bidding in the first round can really set you up to uh, have some advantages in the second half. Really good game. Um, they just came out with another version of this called the... It's like, a, it's like a car one, but it adds a third round of doing something. I don't really fully understand what it is, but I look forward to, to learning how to do it. Um, 
That was Romigo Griffin. I oh, mean, what's the name of that? Auto Autorama, Autorama, something like that. Anyway, love for love for sale. Uh, I think it will forever be one of my favorite games. Great game, number twenty-five. 24 Caverna the Cave Farmers. I believe we've talked about Agricola already. I hope so we did because I know I like Caverna more than I like Agricola. And um, so, but they're kind of, they're, they, you can see how they are from the same design space. Uh, but Caverna takes uh, some of the things about Agricola that I don't really like and don't thematically make sense to me and kind of diminishes those parts of the games and then adds these other parts uh, to the game that I really enjoy. Uh, so in this one, like you're, you're, you're in a cave and you're, and you're farming the outside, but you're also trying to build up your cave. Uh, and you, you can have donkeys and you can dig in there and find ore and coal and, and uh, find ways to score those uh, efficiently. Uwe Rosenberg doing his thing. He does it really well. This is a really awesome game. Number 24, Caverna the Cave Farmers. 23, that's pretty clever. Uh, Ganchon Clever, as I, as I own it, I believe. I have the German version. And um, I actually have not played the, the, um, the physical copy of this all that much. I played it a few times at BGG Spring on the, on the SDJ tables. Um, uh, I got my own copy. I think I've only played my own copy like one through twice. Uh, since I got it, but the app, <laughs> the single player app version of this is addictive. I have played it hundreds of times, if not thousands, don't tell my wife. Um, it's so fun. The sequels. So one thing you don't see on here are the sequels, uh, the twice as clever or, uh, dope out so clever, I think is a German name. And then, uh, um, clever cubed or whatever the it just came out the third one they're not on my list because i don't own the physical copies and have not played the physical copies uh but i've played the app so much um all of them uh the third one just came out i just man there's something about the the flow of this game trying to get these combinations together um all the different varieties of them uh so good so so good uh, anyway, number 23, that's pretty clever. Number 22, Raw. Reiner Kinesia auction game. Uh, you know what's really interesting about this auction game? <laughs> it's like you're, you're, you're auctioning off these things, and then these bad things come up into the lots. And it's like, ugh, do I take this lot? You know, it has this crappy thing. that has this other stuff in there that I really want. Um do we just let it go and wipe out and I lose these other things that are going to be really helpful for me? Uh, and then also like you're, you're bidding with like these finite um, bids. Like you have these three bidding numbers. That's what you have. How are you going to make them work for you? Uh, when you call raw is the, the essential uh, decision point on your turn. Uh, I play this with two players. I play it with uh, five players. I play it with all the player counts in between. Always have a good time. Ryan Kinesia, the king of auctions. Number 22, raw. Great game. Uh, this version, this uh, that you're seeing on the screen, I, did, I played at BGG Spring, got it from the uh, from the library. I did not enjoy it. I did not think it was an upgrade. Uh, the old, uh, I have like a, was it Rio Grande? Uh, yeah, Rio Grande version, um, which I think is also not the best version. There's a slightly, I, or anyway, I have the edition uh, that is not quite as nice as some of the other editions. That one's better. I don't know what these people were thinking when they made this one. Anyway, they did not make it better. Uh, 21, Azul, Summer Pavilion. Just talked about Azul. Uh, Summer Pavilion is the third one in the series. Uh, this is my favorite way. Uh, this is my favorite of the three. Um, it's a little thinkier, a little more gamery, um, um, but you know, all, all the people I've played Azul with, and I showed this one, and, and even the Sega one, Stained Glass of Sintra, all three of the games are just excellent. All three of them play well with uh, all the player counts, um, all of them, they're just good. You know, this one, I would definitely play Azul with someone, and then play this one with them, so they... 
kind of walk into it. I don't think you have to, uh, but especially someone who's not like a big heavy gamer, play Azul, so simple to learn, and then teach them this one that just uh, puts it up a notch. Great game. Azul, Summer Pavilion. Number 20, Villa, just Inca and Marcus Brand. Uh, fantastic game. I really like this one because it kind of plays with the idea of aging. Uh, you're going around the circle, and every time you go around the circle, you have to kill off one of your one of your uh, family and then get them in the right part of the cemetery uh, to bring glory to your family name. Um, the way you're collecting the cubes and using those cubes to do the actions in this game is just great. Uh, it's tight. It is difficult. It is stinky. Uh, it is fantastic. Uh I'll always try Inca Marcus Brand's games because of the village. Uh, it's so good. Uh, anyway, number 20, village. Number 19, Coimbra. Um, this game is so good. Um, it's a dice uh, drafting game uh, where uh, and then you're like drafting these dice and it dictates how much you're going to pay for something and what order you're going to select these cards from and you're going to use those cards to push yourself up these different tracks and and the color that I you take uh, dictates what kind of income you're going to get points or money or or uh, like military might or or movement around the board moving around the board is so tight difficult and essential and and doing that well is a big part of the game I love this game the only thing I wish about this game is that they, I I want them to make an expansion with some more cards in it. Uh, the one thing is if you put, after you play this game a number of times, it's like you're seeing the same cards all the time, and you're fighting over the same cards. Yeah, if there's just a little bit of variability in those cards, uh, make us think about different uh, strategies or whatever. I don't know. But maybe that, that deck of cards is so well balanced, and that's where all this great tension comes from. Maybe adding more variability in those cards would make the game worse, but I don't know. It's the only criticism I have of it. I love the game. Number 19, Coimbra. Number 18, The Quacks of Quedlinburg. I played this game so many times at BGG Spring. I was just hanging out at the table. I probably played it 10 times or more. People would walk up. I was like, hey, do you know how to play this game? Hey, do you want to learn how to play this game? Hey, I'll teach it to you. Uh, even if I wasn't playing, even if I was just teaching them. I, just, I had so much fun with this game. Uh, it took me a while to get my own copy. <coughs> but once I did, I played it a lot. Um, my wife likes this game. Kids like this game. Uh, the push your luck aspect of this game is so fun. You're drawing things out of the bag and, oh, you made your potion explode. Or, man, I got the, I got those pumpkins uh, right in time for that, that red uh, mushroomy type thing, whatever that thing is. Uh uh, it has some variability. The tokens can be different things in different uh, combinations. Uh, so good. I don't have the expansion. I need to get the expansion. Play the. Um, I heard lots of good things about it. Uh, but I have so much fun just the base game. I, I don't know. Great game. Quacks of Quedlinburg. 17 Lost Cities. Uh, so good. I've been playing this game of. Uh, for 10 years. It's one of the first games I got. Um, I got it really early on, and I have just been playing it. I've played consistently. I, I imagine I've played it every year for the last 10 years. Um, at least a little, you know, maybe waxing and waning a little bit. Uh, I just played this uh, uh, last month, I think, maybe two months ago. Got demolished. Had fun while I was getting demolished. Uh, I don't know. There's just something about the tension in this game where you are uh, picking up cards, playing cards, picking them up from the center, uh, digging for the one more handshake to make your this the color that you've been holding on to uh, be worth a lot, and running out of time, trying to extend this. Ah, so good. Such a good game. Number 17, Lost Cities. Number 16, Last Will. I just played this game right before I started making this video. I was like, hey, I haven't played this game for a little while. I love this game. Man, it's so good. I lost by one point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's so good. Uh, so this is like the Brewster's Millions uh, trying to lose all your money game. Uh, and man, just the wit, you know, 
you could change the theme where you're where instead of losing money you're you're gaining points or whatever and it'd be the same game uh but it's the way that you choose your actions it's the way that you um you know uh we talked about like fresco like when you wake up dictates all things lots this kind of has this is like if you go earlier in the round uh you get fewer actions uh, or you have this different combination of how many cards you get to draw uh when you get to go um it, this game is so good uh and it plays pretty quick uh you know, there's a little bit of mental investment in trying to learn the game, uh, but it totally pays off. Great game. Number 16, Last Will. Ah, 15, Santiago. This was my favorite game for a long time. Uh, remember the first time, after the first time I played, I was like, oh, this, this is exactly what I want in a game. Um, and it was my favorite game. I didn't get to play it a ton. Uh, it was hard to get out for whatever reason, or, but it's, you know, I'd, I'd get to play it once or twice a year. Every time I play it, I was like, oh, this game's so fun. Whenever people ask me, what's your favorite game? This was my answer. Um, and uh, ironically, I, I play it more now. And it's kind of slipping in. It's no longer my favorite game. Uh, still, I really like it. Uh, just, it's more that there's other games I've played that I, I really enjoy. Uh, but yeah, so this game, you are, you are bidding. Uh, you are being mean. You are trying to direct the flow of the water. You're trying to bribe people. You're trying. You're making like these temporary alliances uh, that you know aren't going to last beyond that moment, but they're really important in that moment. Um, um, anyway, really good game. Uh, an excellent, excellent game. Number fifteen, Santiago. Uh, Fourteen, Istanbul. Rudiger Dorn. Just knocking it out of the park. Uh, so this has like this weird, um, you know, you're you're dragging these workers around the board and then picking them back up, and so you're you're scattering them as you're moving around, and you're kind of kind of going back on yourself, picking them back up, and trying to do it in an efficient enough manner uh, in order to get these gemstones, uh, which you can get in a number of different ways. You can buy them, you can trade for them, you can. Uh, make your cart really awesome and, and earn one in that way. And, uh, yeah, just this game, uh, it's not too hard. You can play with a lot of people. plays pretty quick. Um, really satisfying when you're done. You, you feel clever when you do clever things. Really great game. Istanbul, number 14. Number 13, Yokohama. Uh, sort of the same as Istanbul. This is you're like scattered around like these workers, and and then you're moving through them and picking them back up, and uh, you're just trying to do things really efficiently, and laying down these paths, giving yourself options because other people are gonna take what you want, and you might not have enough money to flow through their presidents, and uh, or maybe you have to wait a turn to take an action, and uh, but yeah, just a really good game. Uh, like the the race and the tension in uh, getting the the resources that you need to pull off uh, a tile before someone else, uh, racing that customs house, the church, um, trying to get those technologies and and then use those technologies efficiently to help you win the game. Really good, really good, solid game. Uh, excellent, excellent, excellent. Number thirteen, Yokohama. Number 12, A Feast for Odin, Uwe Rosenberg. Just, again, great designers to make great games. And this one is great. Um, you're using these workers that go out on this giant board that has a bajillion different options. And you're just trying to get the correct resources to get you these tiles that are the right shape that you put on your board uh, to give some bonuses, to score you some points, to avoid negative points, going out and getting more tiles that you can put things on. Uh, to score points and get resources and just get crazy. Um, great game. Plays amazing with two. Plays fantastic with four. Really good. Uh, um, just a really good game. Number 12, A Feast for Odin. Number 11, Bora Bora. Steffenfeld. Um... I think this is my second favorite Stefan Feld game. I think it was one more on the list. 
Uh, and again, Stefan Feld, almost all the games, the scoring uh, part of it, very similar to one another. How you how you are choosing your actions and how you're getting getting about that scoring and is different. And um, I mean, yeah, there's lots of different ways to score. Um, you know, some people criticize it. It's like, oh, you do one thing, get four points. Oh, you can't do that. Do this, get three points. Uh, but you know, there there's some cleverness in in doing it the right way and uh, and uh, being efficient, uh, figuring out the puzzle. Anyway, I really enjoy this game. Number eleven, Bora Bora. Number ten, Codenames Duet. By far my favorite way to play Codenames. Um, Codenames is a really good game. Codenames Duet, fantastic, excellent, top tier game, um, for sure. And uh, what's really cool is you are playing with another player. You are on the same team. Uh, you're both looking at different sides of the same card, and you are trying to get each other to guess the name or the the cards that are on your side. And uh, each side has three bad cards. And the tricky thing there, like one of, I, I really love the way they did this. It it's so neat and it. One, it gives you more information, and two, makes you a little scared. <laughs> but uh, one of the black cards is a black card on the other person's. And so you know uh, one of those black cards is going to be a black card on the other side. Okay? One of the black cards is a card that you need to guess. It's black on your side, but you have to guess that card, uh, one of those three cards, in order to win the game because it's a good card on their side. And then one of the other ones is, like, I believe it was a neutral um, on the other side. And uh, But it's interesting because, uh, one, it makes the game interest. It, it like gives you more information uh, about cards. It, and sometimes you hear, you hear a clue and like, oh man, that lines up perfectly with this black card. I have to pick one of those black cards though. And so it can, it can one, give you some more uh, confidence, but also just a little bit of fear. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I've had so many, I had so many fun times playing this game with different people. It was a great date game when I was dating. Um, you know, you want to find out whether you can compatibly talk to another person and, and get on the same wavelength, wavelength as them. Codenames do that. It's a great game. Number nine, Trajan from Steffenfeld. And I lied. There's one more Steffenfeld. Steffenfeld's a great designer. I really enjoy his games, and uh, they're bunching up here at the top. Uh, but this one, uh, again, it, it's the way that you pick your actions. Um, this has a Moncala thing where you're picking up all the little cylinders from one bucket and dropping off one by one until you get to the end, and that's your action. And you're also trying to line up those colored cylinders so you can get some bonuses and you're trying to go out and you're trying to do all these different things and focus on some of them to do them really well and do other ones to score some extra points and set yourself up and you're trying to get the majority and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it's just really good. Really, really good game. And number 92 on BGG, I think that's a little underrated. I think people should play it some more and, and rank it higher because it's a great game. Number nine. And Steffenfeld again, number eight, The Castles of Burgundy. Uh, this game plays so well uh, with two, three, four players. Um, it can be a little thinky with four players. And I think with two players, it really shines just because it just goes quicker. Uh, and it has the same level of thinkiness. Two players a little more random. Uh, not all the tiles will come out into the game. Uh, four players a little more deterministic. You you know that every tile is going to show up uh, for the most part. Uh, and so you can really hang back and wait for something and, and really hope that you can position yourself to get, get certain things. Uh, but yeah, and it's just this puzzle of putting tiles on your little kingdom uh, and trying to do it in a way that's going to score you the most points. Great game. Castles of Burgundy. Number seven, Teotihuacan, the City of Gods. Uh, Daniel Tassini, who is uh, part of the design team of some other games uh, that we've seen, and I think some games that we're going to see still. Uh, really love this game. 
um, the thinkiness, the moving around the board, uh, as you play from game to game and you, and you use the tiles to change the order in which the action spaces are on the board, uh, creates a totally different puzzle. Even though your the goal is the same, uh, that puzzle is just a little bit different uh, with those coming in different order. The uh, anyway, uh, this just checks off so many, so many check boxes of mine for games that I love, and uh, this hits them all. Teotihuacan, City of Gods, Dominion. Uh, this is the game I have easily played the most uh, over the last 10 years. Um, what, there was one year I played it over 100 times uh, physically. Um, I've played this thousands of times in digital platforms. I am not a shark. I am not great at it. But I love the puzzle. I love trying to figure it out. I like playing against the computer and just kind of figure out the set of cards that I'm playing with. I love playing against other people and finding those little margins and you know, and I don't love the attack cards. In fact, it, when I play it, play it uh, the physically, a lot of times I'll kind of, if an attack card comes up, I'll kind of get rid of it. Uh, not so much online, just because the online plays so quickly. Um, anyway, deck building, Donald Baccarino, brilliant. Uh, this is the one game where every expansion is just an automatic buy from me. Uh, even the last one, uh, I have actually, actually haven't broken the shrink up the last one, mostly because it was, I got it right, you know, COVID hit and I ended up playing online and the expansion was online. I played a ton of the expansion that way. And, um, and, and so I feel really like I know the expansion really well. Um, and then, yeah, I'll, I'll probably open it up. I'll probably fold it into my, uh, um, into I've kind of consolidated the collection into a couple boxes. I need to do that with that one. And, but yeah, so good. So good. This makes me a little sad. This has fallen down in the BGG ranks uh, to like 94. This was a top 10 game for a long time on BGG, and it's kind of fallen out of favor. But man, I just still love this game. It is so fun. Uh, number five, It's a Wonderful World. This is the new hotness for me. This game got me through the darkest days of the COVID uh, quarantine. I played it a ton. Played it. Uh, I've, I played it a handful of times with other people, but mostly solo mode. Uh, over a hundred times. Uh, I've whipped out 10 games in one day uh, in between things that I was doing. Um, so good. Uh, this is an engine builder. Uh, where you're taking this hand of cards uh, and you're drafting cards in the solo variant, you're, uh, you have like five cards and you're making decisions with those and you get five more and make decisions with those. Uh, in the multiplayer game, you're drafting a card, pass along, drafting a card, pass along, and then decide what you're going to do with them. Uh, the way this the engine building works in here is just so... It's so simple, clean, and smart. And then where you're trying to get these cards... and it. One thing that's really interesting in this game to me is sometimes you feel like in the early game things just are not going your way, uh, but you're doing your best, you're plugging along, and then, like, second round, things uh, start clicking a little bit better, than, but you're still like, oh, man, I'm not going to be very good. And then things can just kind of, you know, like, you're planting the seeds for a really awesome end game. Uh, and I've, I've surprised myself uh, how well my end game score was in games that I... And, and man, and just that that journey, the high lows, the the fun. This is a great game. It's a wonderful world. Uh, I think some expansions are coming out real soon. I look forward to getting those and playing those. Number four, Railways of the World. Um, I kind of include all the expansions in there. I have most of them. I think the only thing I have not played in this series of the is the Railways Through Time. I actually own it though. Can we see it in the? I think it's just right out of frame, right here. Anyway, um, so good. I've played this a ton. Um, I've played the the big boards with six players. I've played it two player quite a bit. I've played with three or four players quite a bit. I'm at the point where three players kind of feels like. Um, there's some balance issues. Uh, if you're playing with three players, 
uh, one person tends to stay out of the fray and they tend to be the winner um, just because the competition is fierce for the other two. Um, so you have to be careful with that. But um, yeah, so this is a, you're, you're building connections uh, on the railway, uh, the different maps for different parts of the world, trying to connect cities and deliver goods cubes from one city to another city. Uh, you're trying to get these contracts uh, and like these special cards, service delivery cards that pop up. Um, yeah, just a really good game. Um, I have not played Steam, Age of Steam, which are sort of riffs on the same idea. Uh, from what I've read, I think even if I play them, I would like Railways of the World better. I probably should play them just to give them a fair shake. Uh, but man, I don't know. I have so much fun with this game. I, I don't. I, I think like introducing like a, a, a variant in the same theme almost isn't worth it to me. And maybe I'm just making excuses to not spend the money. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. This is an excellent game. If you haven't played it, you should try it. It's great. That's all I can say. Number three, Zulka in the Mind Calendar, Danielle Tassini. Uh, so great. Uh, so this one has like this. The gimmick is the gears. You're putting workers on these gears. Each round the gears rotate and they move on to more powerful actions. Uh, and the timing of when you put on workers, when you take off workers, having the corn to pay to put the workers on. Um you're trying to move up these different temple tracks. You're trying to gain resources. You're building buildings that give you technologies and powers. And uh, the thinkiness puzzle, the tactical responses, the strategic thinking in this game are just excellent. Uh, one of the greatest games of all time. Uh, so fantastic. I love this game. Zulk in the Mayan Calendar. Number two, The Voyages of Marco Polo. This game is great. This is uh, Daniel Tassini, Simone Luciano. Luciani? How do you say that? Anyway, great game. Um, this is a game about moving around the board. And it's hard to move. <laughs> uh one really interesting thing about this game is like there's like three main paths that you can take, and once you get and um, there's a, this incentive from the beginning of the game where it's almost impossible where, where you kind of have to touch on two of the the pathways, and it's not hard, it's not easy to switch between the two. It's a big pain in the butt if you ever have to double back. It's a mistake, and I get trapped into it all the time. Um, uh, everyone has these special powers. Everybody's special special power is amazing, and you wish you had it. But then, this the, your opponent is thinking the same thing about the one that you have, uh, because they're all awesome and um, and using those to your ability, your best ability to to carve out an advantage is just great. This is a fantastic, excellent, awesome, amazing game. Voyages of Marco Polo. Play it right now. So if you want to come over right now and play the game with me, I'll play Voyages of Marco Polo with you. Love it. All right. And finally, number one. Great Western Trail. Alexander Pfister. Um, I played this game a couple of times. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I remember I was, in, I was in Spokane. I was at an uncle's game store downtown. And I can't remember why I was just hanging out, um, but I had some time. And I just asked the guy, that were, it, this game was on my mind. And I asked the guy at the counter, I said, do you guys have a great Western trail? I was looking around on the, on the game shelves and it wasn't there. He's like, oh, let me guess, let me check the computer. And he looks in there and he's like, oh, we don't have a copy, but we have one at our other store in the, in the Valley Mall, which is not close. And um, I was like, you know, I don't have anything going on today. Uh, I'm not in a hurry to get home. Got 60, 70 bucks in my pocket, burned a hole. He's like, do you want me to reserve it for you? I was like, yeah, reserve it for me. 
hopped in my car, drove all the way out to the Valley Mall, <laughs> ran up there and grabbed my copy. At the moment I was doing it, I felt so stupid. I was like, why am I doing this? Uh, anyway, took it home. It's hard playing it. Uh, one thing that really turned the, the tides on this game and like in my collection. Um, and so I don't know, I've, I've referenced, uh, I, I was d married for a long time, got divorced. I was divorced for a while. And uh, during this time, um, uh, I ended up playing games a lot with another another divorced guy, and uh, and this other guy who I knew from church and from uh, community stuff, and uh, he was a teacher like I was, and um, he he ended up going through a divorce and needed some needed some guy time, and so he he came over a lot, uh, me him and this other divorced guy and. We is our little divorce guys club, and he loved this game. He was terrible at it. I don't know if he ever won, but he loved it. We played it every day. I was looking through the stats. We played this like 30 times in a month. So we must have played it almost every single day. We played it twice a couple, twice a day a couple times. Uh, he loved this game. And the more and more I played it, I was like, this game is amazing. Uh, the way that you're going through this, this pathway, uh, the puzzle and how it switches up from game to game as you randomize uh, these different buildings on the trail, as you're building your own buildings and positioning them and, you know, trying out all the different strategies, uh, trying to get lots of cowboys. When you can't get cowboys, you got to pivot to something else, moving that train along, um, you know, so good. This is such a good game. Um, I, I, you know, I haven't played it a ton this year. Um, just the cult of the new is overtaken. I, I and I'm always trying to play new games, and um, you know, I don't have that divorce guys club anymore. Uh, coming over every day and playing games, uh, and so I kind of miss out on on the ability to play these bigger, heavier games uh, as consistently and solidly as I used to. Um, yeah, my life is great. I, you know. It's a trade-off, uh, one that I happily made. Uh, but yeah, this is just a, just a great game. Um, there's a a game. So Alexander Fisher, Mara Kaibo. Um, I I got it just right before I started making this series. Uh, I played it um, in November the, uh, of 2020, uh, right after the cutoff of when I I made this list, and. Uh, and you could see the similarities, and the and I've gotten to play it a couple times. And if I was going to remake that list right now, uh, Great West Trail would be number one. Mark Ivo, maybe not top ten, but top twenty. A uh, fantastic game. It, it hits some of the same beats, but does it in a slightly different way. And um, anyway, Alexander Fister uh, doing it right. A uh, great designer. Um, you know, I don't love everything he's done. But he definitely, definitely all the things that he, he does that I liked, he put them in this game. And uh, yeah, yeah, I I keep gushing on and on and on. But, you know, I love games. And uh, making this, this list and talking about it has been fun for me. And hopefully it's been fun for you. Uh, so um, let me reveal uh, the last little thing here. So, uh Actually, I was talking to my daughter <laughs> a year ago, and uh, said, oh, it would be funny to make a Marco Pollo. Um, uh, and this could, hits on a couple of different funnies in my life. Uh, <laughs> but the whole Marco Pollo, uh, chicken Marco Polo. Uh, and so, anyway, I was talking to this with my daughter, and she got a friend of hers to uh, to Photoshop some chicken heads <laughs> on the Marco Polo polo box, and anyway, she thought it'd be, she helped me put together this uh, this uh, slideshow, and uh, she had this in there. I thought it was funny. Thought I'd share it with you guys uh, the triple S plus omnipotent tier uh, Marco Polo. Um, every game is better themed with chickens. Uh, anyway, this has been uh, U.G. Darn friends. I'm Elton Killian. Uh, this is uh, all the board games ranked uh, that I've played in the last 10 years. I hope you've enjoyed them, and uh, have a great day.
where? I'm making a YouTube video, guys. 